and welcome class to hear another lecture. Uh, today we will be working through part two of chapter 12, wherein we are no longer talking about liquids, but instead we are turning our attention to the solids. All right, so the solids conversation, I am breaking up into two different pieces. The first is going to mirror more uh, of that of our previous lecture. So we're gonna be talking about the properties of the solids first. After we are done talking about the properties of the solids, we're gonna talk in more detail about their construction. Since solids actually do have rigid shapes and volumes, it's going to be necessary for us to talk about how these shapes and volumes come together. All right, so we are going to start with the basic definition of the solid state, what it means uh, to be a solid, the two different types of solids, because of course a solid is going to be uh, comprised of a material that is, again, in some type of definite shape with a definite volume, but what arrangements actually lead to that? Well, first, uh, there is what is known as the amorphous solid. So this is a solid that is formed by a disordered array of atoms, ions, or molecules that we can see pictured here. Now, there are uh, lines being drawn between each of the, uh, <laughs> the atoms, the little circles here. What we have illustrated, uh, in this amorphous solid, like specifically what this is an illustration of, is that of glass, also known as silicon dioxide. So glass, as well as a great number of other amorphous solids, are or have a shape that is inconsistent in arrangement. Right, there's no common pattern, there's no long-term uh, like pattern that is seen here. The silicons and the oxygen seem to just be kind of haphazardly stuck together. Uh, how this happens or why this happens is because the solid was very rapidly cooled. Um, glass is, for instance, commonly formed um, like down on the beaches when lightning strikes sand. Now, when lightning strikes sand, which is also made of silicon dioxide, we get a very rapid melting and then cooling of these atoms and molecules back into this new formation. But they don't have the chance or the time to really arrange themselves in this nice long-term or a long-range, uh, like, consistent pattern, this really rigid structure. So we end up with something that looks molecularly a little bit more amorphous. But these uh, molecules or these, uh, these types of solids made up of atoms, ions, molecules, etc., are in fact solids. They are stuck in place. As we know from experiencing glass, it's very rigid. It has a constant shape. And as a result, it's gonna have a very distinct volume. Now we're gonna be spending most of our time talking about the crystalline solids. These are an ordered array of atoms, ions, or molecules, which we can see pictured here on the right. There is definitely an order here. There is a consistency, consistency with how the atoms are arranged, giving us these really beautiful hexagonal kind of shapes. Now the illustration on the right corresponds to that of quartz, which is also silicon dioxide. Quartz forms over much longer periods of time, giving the atoms in this structure more time uh, to fit into a structure uh, that is going to be consistent in the long range, that's going to uh, be a little bit more stable as a result, even more rigid as a result. So as I said, we are going to be focusing in this class mostly on the crystalline solids due to their long range consistency. Uh, their properties are also going to be a little bit more consistent as a result. Uh, and of course, because we like to pick out things like chemical formulas, uh, the consistency of the crystalline solids is just gonna make it a little, a little bit easier to observe. But just be aware that amorphous solids do exist uh, and they are solids in construction that had quickly heated up, quickly cooled down, and just kind of had to snap into whatever arrangement the atoms happened to be in as a result. All right, so what types of materials make solids? Well, of course, <laughs> the most straightforward answer is the metals. Metals are very common solids for us to come into contact with. So pure metals are pure substances. If we think back to chapter one and all of the different ways that we classify matter. A pure substance is a substance that is made up of one single element type. So pure metals are those made of pure uh, iron or pure 
uh, mercury, pure aluminum, so long as there's just one element type arranged in the solid. We've also talked about a number of properties that metals have, for instance, high conductivity, uh, low ionization energy. We can think of all of those properties back from uh, the first semester in the fall. However, what we're going to introduce today is why metals have those very strange characteristics. They arise due to uh, what we have observed to be delocalized electrons in the metal to metal bonds. All right, so the bonding that occurs between metal atoms is not an ionic bond. It is not, <laughs> I just totally misspelled covalent, covalent. It is not a covalent bond. It is something totally different. So in an ionic bond, electrons are completely transferred from one atom to the next, giving us our charged particles. In covalent bonds, electrons are discreetly shared between two different atoms, giving us a covalent bond. Uh, in metals, the electrons end up being what we call delocalized. In other words, they are not localized to one area, but rather every electron, uh, which is being illustrated in this picture as these blue dots, are allowed to travel wherever they want to. So they can float around, they'll be attracted by whatever positive center is the closest, they'll probably be repelled by a bunch of other negative electrons in the process, but they're allowed to go wherever they want. They have total free range. This bonding arrangement is exactly what gives metals all of their unique properties, right? High electrical conductivity occurs because these electrons are able to travel wherever they need to go. So if we suddenly plug this metal into like some type of electrical socket, which just gives us an excess number of electrons, well, these electrons are going to be able to jump straight into the metal and straight on through the structure because they're not going to be trapped in any one specific location. They're going to be able to be delocalized just like all the rest of the electrons and shoot straight on through. Metals also have very low ionization energies, and we've talked about this before. A low ionization energy means that we can lose electrons very easily. And so if we, uh, or we can kind of like connect then the delocalization of electrons and how easy it is to lose them. I mean, if electrons are able to free roam wherever they want to be inside of this structure, it's going to be very easy as a result to just take one electron, give it a little bit of energy, and instead of it traveling through the structure, it's just gonna pop right off because they're free range and can do whatever they want to do. Some other properties that the delocalization of electrons gives rise to is the malleability, the ductile-ness. I'm not exactly <laughs> how to turn that into an adjective. Um, but yeah, metals are malleable, they're ductile, they can be uh, like formed or uh, like made into any type of shape really. So they can be pounded into flat sheets, they can be drawn into wires. And the reason why uh, they can, or the reason why they have these unique physical properties again comes down to the delocalization of electrons. Because there are no rigid bonds between individual atoms or between individual nucleic centers, the electrons again are able to just kind of like go wherever they need to be. All we need to do is to apply some type of force to a metal that has a particular structure, let's say illustrated up above. And as we push unevenly on the structure, let's say we push more on the left-hand side, uh, like upwards and we pull down on the right hand side, which is what applying this type of external force, this like twisting motion, uh, this torsion would do. What we're going to be able, or what we actually see is that the metal atoms are going to shear along the plane in one direction and shear along the plane back down in the other direction. So we can push these atoms around inside the structure because they're not set in stone. The electrons are able to move and therefore the nuclei will also be able to move if enough external force is applied. Now the deformation of the structure can lead to some instabilities. For instance, if you've ever like bent a spoon and then tried to bend it back and then you bend it again and then you bend it back, you'll eventually find that that fulcrum where you had been bending the spoon is a little bit weaker. 
This has to do with uh, such like extreme deformations in that one area. You've just compromised the integrity. You're starting to form two different structures at that point. The electrons uh, don't have as many stable paths to go back and forth. So there is a limit to how we can mess with these metals. But if we want to reset the structure, all we have to do is heat it back up and let it coolly come back down and all of the atoms and electrons will sort of reset into a more stable bonding, uh, like, or delocalized bonding situation again. But not all solids are pure substances. Some solids are going to be homogeneous mixtures. And we call these homogeneous mixtures alloys. So an alloy is a solid state solution. It's very strange sometimes uh, at the general chemistry level to think of a solution, not as an aqueous solution, but rather as something else. Um, but remember that a solution is just a type of homogeneous mixture. And so an alloy is going to be known as a solid state solution. There is going to be at least one metal, have to have at least one, and then some other type of element is going to be present as well. This may or may not be a metal in combination with the first. Uh, sometimes there are going to be non-metals sprinkled throughout, but the important part is that most of the material is going to be made up of some type of host metal. This is what is going to give uh, rise to more alloy characteristics as opposed to some uh, type of ionic compound. Alloys also tend to have different or let's say more reinforced properties as opposed to the like pure substances, host metals uh, types of properties. A really good example of that is the difference between iron and stainless steel. So iron, as we can see illustrated here, yes, is a metal. It has all of those great conductive, malleable types of properties, but an additional property that it has a chemical property is that uh, it is prone to rusting. It's very easy for iron to become oxidized by the oxygen in the atmosphere, turning into rust, which is literally iron oxide. However, if we add a couple of additional elements in trace amounts to iron through uh, some type of like smelting process, we can create something known as stainless steel. Now there are different types of stainless steel, all depending on what elements exactly we're adding, but the most common two uh, elements that get added to iron to create stainless steel are carbon and chromium. And we're not adding enough carbon to make an ionic compound. Again, we're just adding trace amounts, just, just a couple of little pieces of carbon in there, same with the chromium and the sprinkling of the carbon and the chromium from what we've been able to find experimentally is that we strengthen the iron's bonds. Strengthen. So we're strengthening the structure. Uh, stainless steel is much more, we would say, reinforced as opposed to just pure iron. It's not as malleable anymore. It's not as ductile due to the presence of these additional pieces. Uh, in addition, stainless steel is not prone to rusting. So we remove this unwanted chemical property of iron as we turn it into stainless steel, hence why it's called stainless steel. It doesn't really form rust as well as pure iron does. Over time, yes, stainless steel can rust, but it's not as likely to happen, uh, especially spontaneously. Like we, we kind of have to let an extreme amount of time pass or we have to introduce stainless steel to more extreme environmental conditions to get it to start to rust. This is why we use stainless steel in things like building, uh, const well, construction, right, of buildings um, or construction of cars, automobiles. Uh, it's much more reinforced and therefore the structures we build will be more protected. So what does it look like atomically speaking or molecularly speaking to make an alloy, right? I'd already said we're just adding trace amounts of these additional atoms into the host metal. We're not adding enough to turn it into an ionic structure or a covalent structure, but we are going to add just enough to, to tweak the properties. So there are two different ways that we can sprinkle in these trace amounts of additional elements into the metal. And the first type of alloy that we can form as a result is known as a substitutional alloy. In al this is an alloy in which atoms of the non-host material replace 
the host metal atoms within the crystal lattice. Replace is the big word here, hence why this is called a substitutional alloy. It's because we're substituting some of the metal atoms for the non-host material atoms. So we can see a couple of different illustrations down below of uh, what this atomically could look like. So if this hypothetically were the iron structure, the iron is the host in this case. Uh, we can see that there is a majority of these like gray atoms present here and the green ones are, the, are in the mi minority. Uh, we will make a substitutional alloy when the non-host is of approximate equal size as the host. So if the atoms are approximately the same size, it stands to reason that we're just gonna swap one for the other. So this would be like the addition of the chromium into the iron. We would assume chromium and iron are going to have approximately similar sizes because they are uh, nearby each other on the periodic table. Nearby on periodic table. Right, and there are, some, there are some more nuanced rules to it, but we talk about those in more advanced classes, uh, just based off of additional properties of these metals that we don't have the chance to talk about, honestly, in general chemistry. It all comes down to the d orbitals, the tricky, tricky d orbitals. So we're just gonna put a pin in that conversation until the future, and if you're not gonna take inorganic, it's totally fine. The takeaway and what is true 90% of the time is that if our uh, host and non-host are nearby on the periodic table, chances are they will be of approximately equal size and therefore will form a substitutional alloy. Now they don't have to be exactly the same size, which is what we can see in the illustration here on the right. If our host again is going to be the more abundant species, so that's gonna be our iron, we can see that the chromium uh, or whatever metal is listed here, um, is slightly smaller. It's not filling the entire cavity. We can see there's some empty space here, but it is of approximately the same size, and therefore it will swap out uh, like one of the host atoms for this non-host atom, because there's nowhere else that it would fit. Take this in contrast to the other form that an alloy can take, or make, which is known as an interstitial alloy. This is an alloy in which atoms of the non-host material occupy existing spaces within the crystal uh, of the host metal. So the interstitial alloys, uh, which we can see in the illustration pretty clearly down below, are formed when the non-host is smaller, pretty significantly smaller than the host. So these non-host atoms are going to be able to, like they're small enough to be able to fit in these gaps between the host without having to completely swap places with the host. So if we return to our example of stainless steel, all of these grays, again, we would consider to be the iron. Each of these little greens, we would consider to be carbon. Carbon is a non-metal. It is significantly smaller than iron. And so we would assume because carbon is significantly smaller. Again, it is not near iron on periodic table. We're going to assume that it's going to make an interstitial alloy in this case. Uh, in a more extreme illustration on the right where the uh, non-host is like illustrated as being really significantly smaller compared to the host, we can see all of these little uh, like yellow blips representing our non-host material just like fit right inside those like tiny little spaces in between the host. So this is where the name interstitial comes from. Interstitial, when being translated from Latin, literally translates to the spaces between. All right, stitchal meaning space, inter meaning that we're looking between stuff. So these are the spaces between. All right, so the last thing that I want to sit, uh, speak about on <laughs> when it comes to alloys is again, because these are not ionic compounds, these are not covalent compounds, we don't write our chemical formulas for these things in the exact same way. In fact, most of our alloys we uh, represent 
their chemical formulas with just base percentages. How much, uh, <laughs> how much of each of the materials do we have? So for example, uh, stainless steel, which is kind of the example I have been working with, on a commercial scale, chromium, only occupies around 0.036% of all of the structure, right? So if we're thinking in terms of like ionic compounds and covalent compounds, where we try to come up with some type of like least common multiple, uh, or even just dropping the subscripts directly, like what, how many atoms of each type do we have in the molecule? That's gonna be impossible in this case because we have literal trace amounts of the chromium as well as the carbon, which has a percent of 0.075% on average kind of occupying the structure, right? So we have, we have such little carbon and such little chromium. In hindsight, I'm gonna say these figures are not drawn to scale. However, <laughs> uh, it, they're still useful for kind of illustrating the different types of alloys. All right, so if we don't write straight up chemical formulas. Again, the way that we tend to write our uh, like quote unquote formulas for alloys, especially in manufacturing, is just by including the element name and what percent actually occupies the structure in general. And these uh, interstitial or substitutional alloy uh, non-host particles could be anywhere in the structure. They don't have to be in any specific place. And before I forget, of course, last but not least, everything else <laughs> inside of the structure is going to be iron. So the iron is gonna be, what is this, like 99 point blah, blah, blah percent, right? So the iron is gonna be like basically the entire structure and then chromium, carbon, and whatever other type of trace elements might be inside of this, uh, <laughs> this stainless steel material are going to add up to that 100%. But before the tangent gets too long, just the last thing I'm gonna say in conclusion when it comes to the alloys chemical formulas is just to not worry about them. So again, we don't have any specific chemical formula. It's everything being represented in terms of percentages and the materials themselves in the structure could be anywhere sort of like in parallel to uh, the construction of an aqueous solution, right? We don't think of where the solute is inside of this solvent. It's just somewhere and we assume that there's an even mixture because it's homogenous. Same thing is happening here. We don't know exactly where the chromium and the carbon are inside of this iron structure, but we assume that they're evenly spread out and we know the approximate percentages of the construction uh, in terms of like the elemental composition. All right, so let's talk about some solids that are a little bit more familiar, right? Now that we have explained metals as well as the uh, derivations that we can have of metals in the terms of, or in, in terms of alloys, let's turn our attention to solids that we've seen before. So let's talk about some ionic solids. All right, so an ionic solid is a solid that consists of alternating cations and anions in it in some type of repeating pattern. So the most common example that we tend to think about or that we have worked with is sodium chloride. So we can see on the right hand side an illustration of the lattice, ionically speaking, of the crystal or of the ions in the crystal. And the sodium we can see is being labeled as this uh, yellow sphere and the uh, green is going to be our chloride. And so uh, as we can very easily see in this structure, we have alternating patterns of positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. Each of the opposing charges are attracting each other and the like charges are repelling as best as they can. And so as a result, we end up with this really cool uh, alternating pattern. And what's even cooler than the alternating pattern is the fact that this alternating pattern in 3D makes a cube, right? If we connect the outer edges, we can see that there is a pretty clear cube-like shape there we go, box-like shape, uh, creating this, this structure. And if we scale this up to the macroscopic, we can see that salt crystals, when we like really look at them under a microscope, when we really can see their construction, they're not just tiny little specks, they are cube-like as well. So the cube-like structure of our salt crystals can be traced all the way back to the molecular scale. Uh, I think that that's super, super cool that we have this connection between what we can visibly see macroscopically and how we can like 
rationalize this shape, molecularly speaking, and the fact that it comes down to the most stable arrangements of sodium and chloride crystals. Now this can be said for any of our ionic solids, the 3D shape of how the crystal builds up is going to be a reflection of its molecular construction. And we're gonna talk more about this in the next lecture as we focus on exactly how the different uh, like positives and negatives can arrange, like what possible shapes can they make. But of course, not all solids in the world are made up of metals and or ionic crystals. There are also the covalent species as well. And so we have to acknowledge those. And there are two different forms that uh, like covalent uh, <laughs> like bonds can take in, in, uh, inside of some type of solid crystal. So the first is known as a covalent solid. This is going to consist primarily of non-metallic atoms held together in extended 3D networks of covalent bonds. So we're gonna put the emphasis on the bond here. Diamonds and graphite, both comprised of carbon, are excellent examples of covalent solids. The diamond being uh, illustrated here on the left, we can see is a composition of carbons with four bonds around them. So each of these carbons has one, two, three, four bonds around it, uh, as well as one of the carbons that is bonded to it is going to have one, two, three, four bonds to it. So we can expand the cube of this structure into an infinite lattice. And so long as we have carbon, there could always be more bonds. So the great thing about these covalent solids is that, or not the great, but like the cool thing about these covalent solids is that the structure can get to be as large as the material that we have. So we can almost think of this big diamond as one big molecule is what I'm getting at. So the molecule will be as large as the number of carbons that we have, as well as, uh, <laughs> you know, making sure that each of the carbons is going to roughly have four bonds until we get to the exterior of the solid. All right, same thing can be said of the graphite. The structure, the arrangement of all of the carbons looks a little bit different, but we can, for the most part, think of this as well as one big molecule. So the carbon in diamond forms tetrahedral bonding arrangements, and in graphite, for the most part, each carbon forms a trigonal planar uh, shape uh, the dashed lines in between can also be thought of as strong intermolecular forces. Um, just due to the magnitude of the strength, we're kind of somewhere between an intermolecular force and a covalent bond. It's too strong to be one of our previously discussed intermolecular forces, but it's too weak to be just a straight up covalent bond. So these dashed lines are kind of in that gray zone in between. So both of these structures form, again, what we call covalent solids. They're both held together by an extended array of uh, covalent bonds that could continue indefinitely so long as we have the material for it. The other form of a molecular solid, or the other form of a solid made up of nonmetals, is what we call a molecular solid. This is going to consist specifically of molecules held together by strong coordinated intermolecular forces. So in our previous example of non-metals coming together to make some type of solid, we had in, like <laughs> extended arrays of covalent bonds. Uh, here, we have a limited number of covalent bonds, but multiple molecules. So that's the most clear in our structure for sugar on the right. So each of these little individual pieces here is one single C6H12O6, the illustration of which I gathered from the citation below. So in this uh, 3D map of sugar, we have a very set number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, a very discrete number forming discrete molecules, but each of these molecules is going to be coordinated to the next all around it in a very rigid structure according to what types of intermolecular forces can be formed. Now sugar is able to form dipole, dipole, as well as pretty strong dispersive 
forces, uh, London dispersion forces, Van der Waals forces, whatever you wanna call them, because of its relatively large size, uh, molecularly speaking. So we can get some pretty uh, strong intermolecular forces between our structures, and this is exactly what leads to it being a solid. Right, without strong intermolecular forces, uh, particularly in a very rigid uh, kind of preset arrangement, sugar would not form solids, but instead would form a liquid, which is kind of crazy to think about. So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more solid molecular solids will be. Now carbon can also take on another uh, like structure in its pure form. We just talked about the diamond and the graphite. Here we can see uh, what is known as the buckyball. We've talked about this already. We've seen this illustration. This is known as C6D. So there are 60 carbons specifically that come together to form this soccer ball-esque arrangement. Uh, so because there is sort of a definite number of covalent bonds that can be formed here, because if we have any more carbon, it's not gonna be a buckyball, uh, this we would call a molecular solid as multiple buckyballs start coming together and interacting in a coordinated intermolecular forced network. So, in conclusion, today we have talked about pure substances being metals. Uh, we have talked about alloys, so the homogeneous mixture version of a me uh, metallic solid. We've touched on ionic solids. We'll talk more about those in the next lecture. And we have two additional non-metallic solids, both in the form of the covalent and the molecular solid. I do not have any recommended problems from the textbook for you on this lecture. It was very qualitative and so there's no quantitative practice that you can get, but I would strongly encourage you to review these definitions and the structures that these solids can take. If you have any homework, please double check and do your homework. And until next time, when we discuss what are known as unit cells, class is dismissed. <laughs>